And all right, we can go again, go ahead and get started. Jason, you so, want to kick it off and I'll go through the slides. Yeah, do you have the you want to bring the slides up? Yeah. All right. Thanks. Okay. So we're just gonna kind of go through what we've done in the, the dam screening tool for the pilot test that we've been working on over the last few weeks. So I'll start off with a, just a quick review of what, what the dam screen, screening tool is um, in its current status, as well as where we're gonna go moving forward. Um, you'll also hear from Paul, who did a lot of the, the work on the actual application. Jordan McMaster, who developed the structure inventory that we're using. He'll talk about that. Um, Garrett's on, he, might, he may chime in on the <clears throat> some of the training data that we've been using. And then that, that'll, that'll be the majority of what we talk about today. So next slide there, Paul. So just again, the review, um, <clears throat> we'll walk through just quick overview of what the DFC is, the inputs that we developed for the pilot study, some of the results, um, and then we'll talk about what might come next. There's one thing that Paul has been working on. We try to do a lot of validation studies for any of our tools. Um, one of the things he did was the camera dam failure um, that happened a, a few years ago. He looked, he looked at that and set it up in the dam screen tool. If there's time and interest, we can show a little bit of that um, at the end. Okay, next slide. Um, so just, just to be real clear, the current version of the dam screening tool, it, it includes what we call the consequences module only, which is the HTC RAS two-dimensional innovation model um, to get the inundation, and then life sim, which gives us potential damage and potential loss of life for whatever scenarios we set up. That's what the dam screening tool is today. Um, we have plans to build that out to a full risk engine, which includes the, the loading, the hydrology, the performance, and so we'll, we'll do the full risk. But right now, just so everybody's clear, it's just the, the consequences model. All right, next slide. So to, to get this to run, to, to run the dam screening tool as it is today, uh, to get the RAS2D where we pull from some available data source, international data sources or provided by, by you, um, you need a train and we'll, doc, we'll, we'll dive into the train we used and some comparisons between the low res and high res where we had that. Um, and then some a land cover, which gives us enough information to come up with the rough, roughness coefficients for the manning in values for the inundation model. So those are things we were able to pull from some some global data sources. If you want more detail on land cover, Garrett can talk a little bit about that. Um, so the life for the, for the consequences, we need a structure inventory, so, and that means the location of the structure the value of the structure if you want to do uh, damages. How many people are in that? We like to do day and night if possible to show how population shifts throughout the day. Number of stories to get an idea of how, if people can stay above the water. Construction type, because different types of buildings can withstand different forces of water. So whether or not a structure gets toppled or not, um, that helps. And foundation height for similar reasons. So you see in the image there, Sorry, real quick, Paul. Um, all those blobs with numbers in them, that's looking at the dam screen tool, and that tells you how many structures are in that area. We don't show every single box because that's just too much data to throw at the, the web interface. As you zoom in, those dots become available. Um, I'm hovering over one of the dots that shows it's a residential structure, one story, um, no basement. Nighttime and daytime population are both three, and the total value here is, is about 670,000. 
again, uh, Jordan will go into a little bit of the data he used to develop the structure inventory for this area. All right, Paul. Okay, and then what's provided <clears throat> by the user through the interface um, for the 2D inundation, we just start with a, a maximum inundation boundary uh, that the user provides to let us know, okay, here's, here's the 2D flow area where we're gonna build the mesh and apply the water. Um, then a location of the dam, that, that gives us the loading source where we apply the, the breach hydrograph. Currently, you have to provide the breach hydrograph. So you have to come up with a breach hydrograph outside the dam screening tool and provide it through through the interface. And then there's a bunch of optional parameters. If you want to dig into resolution and, and some of the boundary conditions, you can change some of that. If you if you're into the hydraulics, understand RAS, you can you can change some of those optional parameters. Okay, next, Paul. Oh. Uh, for live sim, we ask some basic uh, information about emergency management for preparedness and warning time. So, quick one more time. It, it, it looks like this. Is it for evacuation planning? Is their evacuation planning, is it flood specific? Do they have an idea of the potential inundation from that could occur? Or is it a more general all hazards plan? Or is, or is there nothing available? Or if you don't have any idea about the evacuation planning, you can leave it as unknown. And how this works is we use this information and the information we have from the social science community to predict how quickly warning is gonna spread and how many people will respond to that warning and try to get out of the way before the, the water shows up. Um, when we run live sim, we run it with a lot of uncertainty. So you're gonna see a range of outputs, right? When you're dealing with people and and life loss, obviously there's a lot of uncertainty. We try to capture that. So if you say unknown, you're just gonna have a wider spread of uncertainty than if you have some of these parameters uh, where you can come up with estimates. But we just have those, those three um, emergency management preparedness pr parameters, so evacuation planning, community awareness, flood warning effectiveness, and then the last piece that obviously is going to be important for understanding potential loss of life is, is warning time. Are we dealing with a event, maybe an overtopping event where you see the flood coming well in, in, in advance, or is it going to be a surprise event uh, where people don't have a lot of time? So you, you come up with, you provide an estimate of warning time, and then life then runs and comes up with estimates of damages and, and loss of life. Next slide. I think these came in in the wrong order, sorry, so, yeah. Okay, so, future plans. And by future, we mean uh, very soon, uh, as in we're expecting to launch this next week. We're gonna have the breach modeling built in to the dam screen tool. So you don't have to come up with a breach hydrograph outside of the dam screening tool. You can use some of the well-known approaches, um, like the Froelich equation, and provide information about how big of a dam, how tall the dam is, um, what your pool elevation is, the volume, and it'll come up with estimates of what the breach parameters look like. You provide that. If you've, if you've ever done dam breaks in AGC RADS before, this will look familiar to you, but this takes a lot of the, the work that you have to do right now outside of the dam screening tool. It allows you to do it within the dam screening tool and come up with that breach hydrograph. So that's gonna be a, a big improvement. Um, also, you'll be able to do multiple load sources. Right now, you can just add one load source, for example, the breach hydrograph, um, and it puts that <coughs> hydrograph out there. But you can't, and like in the image you see here, that orange line, maybe you have a, your dam that's gonna breach down into a river that already has water in it. So you can put a base flow in there or a hydrograph in that so you're not just breaching into to dry, dry areas. Um, we're also adding the ability to do some terrain refinement. So if you have terrain, but it doesn't have a channel carved out, you'll be able through the dam screening tool to carve out a channel or, or build in some levees if you don't have a, a high enough resolution terrain that has that information. So this is coming out next week and it's gonna, it's gonna really improve the usability and 
the ability to do a little more sophisticated analysis. Uh, next, you can click through this. So, like I already mentioned this, but um, we're going to expand this to the, the full risk computation. So, what you see here is the current damp screening tool where all you have is the consequences module, that tab. Um, <clears throat> we're building this all based on what we've already launched, which is our levy screening tool. Um, so, you see it has all the information, the hazard, consequences, performance, and the risk results. So, in the future, next year, and some of this is pending on funding, but um, we will build this out to, to do that full risk calculation. Okay. That, that's what I had, and I'm to turn it over to Paul now. If there's, if there's any questions, um, I, I, now is probably a good time. If you have any general questions about the damn screening tool, uh, feel free to jump in. Just one quick question for the second part. How, when do you think it's going to launch? The the full risk calculation. Yeah. I, I hate kind of promising these things because uh, there's always a lot of flexibility in this, um, and we're we're kind of dependent on funding right now, waiting on a funding source to to come through. So, I would. Say um, we'd have something at least an, an a alpha slash beta version that's really testable um, next, hopefully by the end of this next calendar year, so about a year from now. Um, but that's that's a that's a rough estimate. I don't want to get too carried away. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so this next section we want to talk about for the the pilot study that we did in Brazil, how the different pieces of the input came together. And so I'm going to turn it over to Jordan first to talk about the structure inventory. Uh, hey, hey, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Jordan McMaster. So I, I played a pretty large role in uh, developing this initial. Uh, base level data set for the national structure inventory uh, for Brazil. Um, I plan to be brief or as brief as I can be here. I know we have a lot to cover, um, but I do want to let you guys know I, I, I did develop a pretty long document that details um, how this was developed. Um, and then it also provides links to those sources um, for, for your review um, and then for any updates that you plan to do going forward. Um, so when we refer to the National Structure Inventory, we're just referring to a point uh, shape file, um, like the one you see pictured here, um, that spans the entire country. So the inventory is pictured here, and then each point is attributed uh, those fields that are listed just to the right. Um, so uploading an inventory to the DST requires that uh, these fields be included in the inventory, um, and then they're populated as well. Uh, so in the next slide, we'll we'll cover uh, some of the data that was used to populate these these values. Uh, so starting on the left uh, at item one, um, the Google Open Building Data um, that was used for uh, structure location, um, as well as uh, the area of the footprint. Um, that's not a required input uh, to actually run consequences, but it was used to calculate the structure. Uh, and content values. Um, data from the Brazil Institute for Geography and Statistics, so IBGE. Um, this was used for municipality and meso region boundaries. Uh, so these are shape files um, pulled from their their site, uh, and this was used to spatially aggregate uh, the data, uh, as well as for population um, through their household sample survey, so the PNAD. Um, the population data corresponds to those four fields highlighted in red. Um, so the way they're broken out is by day and night over under 65. Um, but absent better data, uh, we we assumed the day and night values were the same uh, across structure. Um, and if there's better data out there, that can absolutely be adjusted. Um, happy to make those changes. 
uh, damage values and vehicle values. So those come from the National System of Cost Surveys and Indexes of Construction. Um, so this was by uh, square meter that was multiplied by the area from the Google Open Building data. Um, that's where those values come from. And then the Economic Research Institute Foundation had pretty detailed uh, listings of vehicle prices uh, going back like five years. So there were thousands of observations there that we used just to get an average by municipality. Um, there was little readily available data for occupancy type, number of stories, construction type, foundation height, uh, and content value. Uh, so in this first iteration, this is similar to what we did when we developed our national structure inventory. Um, we just assume the most conservative values, um, and then we try to make those better as we as we find data, uh, depending on where we're working. So for occupancy type, it was a single family residential structure, number of stories, single story, construction type wood. Uh, so this would have a more pessimistic stability criteria, um, foundation height, and then content value, which is assumed to be 50% of the structure value. Um, there, is, there are some data sources out there that could refine uh, these fields. So that's, that's outlined in the document. Um, it would just take uh, quite a bit more work uh, to do so. Um, occupancy type and number of stories are two big ones. Um, there, there is data out there. So that's, um, I, I tried to go over that at length in the document. So please take a look at that and then please reach out with any questions. Um, I, th I think those could be two uh, two big fields improved pretty pretty soon. Um, I think you go to the next slide, Paul. Uh, so we briefly covered this already, uh, but the two population variables from the PNAD were the 2021 population and age estimates. So these were aggregated at the municipality level. Um, so it's not super refined, but those were just divided across the structures. Um, and then there was, they were assigned a random variable where they were either rounded up or down. Um, that way we keep the same population estimate, but you do get some variation um, in the structures. Um, these additional fields were not used, um, but there, there could be a path forward to incorporate these in future iterations. Um, again, it would just take some more time, some more uh, thought to, to kind of plot out that logic. Um, there's some loose documentation and what you'll get today that kind of uh, shows a potential path forward um, if, if that's in the future. Um, so again, just please, please take a look through that and don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. Um, but I'll, I'll pass it off to Paul to keep, so we keep moving along. I, have a, okay. I have a question. So yeah. you're saying that you only use the ones shaped in, shaded in blue? The one shaded in white, you didn't use for this model. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so the the population variable and then the age variable were used um, at the municipality level uh, to populate what is in the current iteration. Um, it would take quite a bit more. Um, it would be a more complicated yeah. algorithm to apply the others, but I do think there's a place for them to be incorporated. Okay. Okay. Um, so next, I'll have uh, Garrett discuss a little bit about uh, how he pulled the terrain together. Garrett, you there? Yep. Hey, uh, so I'm Garrett Menachino. I'm a hydraulic engineer. Uh, I'll be talking briefly about the terrain inputs for the hydraulic model. Um, so generally, the terrain is a very important piece of information because it determines the direction of flow um, and what hydraulics look like. So having and using the best available data um, can make a big difference in the results. So with that in mind, um, we to develop the data sets for um, modeling these, these pilot cases, we started with the um, Copernicus uh, 30 meter DEM. And so the benefit there is um, the Copernicus 30 meter DEM is available globally. Um, and that's one of the major benefits. And one of the drawbacks there is it is 30 meters, so it is pretty coarse. Um, so we use that as the base for our terrain. Um, you can see the image on the right um, showing that extent for um, part of the modeling area for one of the dams. And then uh, we are also supplied uh, a higher resolution DEM, a one meter DEM, 
uh, for a smaller extent shown in that that gray box. Uh, so that that's great. That's higher resolution data that we want to make sure to incorporate, and we did. So our final terrain that we used splices these two data sets together. And the benefit of incorporating the the 30 meter DEM from Copernicus is we could we can extend our model extents. Uh, a lot further downstream to look at the potential flooding and life safety risk there. Um, so overall, the total extent here is we're looking at about 80 kilometers of river that we're uh, modeling. All right, next slide, please, Paul. So um, an important consideration here is considering the difference between high resolution and lower resolution DEMs because the terrain is a critical component of the hydraulics model. And so if we look at a comparison of the high resolution terrain versus low resolution there on the image on the right, um, the green line shows for the cross section that I pulled in the area of interest, um, the, the low resolution uh, Copernicus 30 meter DEM. And then the blue lines show um, the high resolution data for that area, and then also what our final terrain looks like. Um, so there is generally a one to three foot. Um, most of the the difference between the terrains is generally within one to three meters. Um, and a few important considerations here is the thirty meter DEM may not always capture the channel. So if you see, there's two low spots in the blue line around stationing of 120 meters and 300 meters those are the channel uh, and the 30 meter dem in this case isn't really picking that up so this isn't always going to be the case um, but if in the future we're using 30 meter dem this would be something to spot check and ensure so um, why this matters is if we're missing portions of the um, channel uh, then we lose conveyance capacity in those portions, so that could affect the hydraulics. And if we, in this case, we're losing um, capacity, that could result in overestimating consequences because we're sending that water out further into the floodplain. So, um, okay, so uh, that's generally the terrain in a nutshell. I'm happy to take questions on it later, um, but Paul, feel free to keep chugging along. Okay, so next I'm going to talk about how we got or how we developed breach hydrographs and actually did two uh, slightly different methods um, since our, our uh, tool was really in flux during this time. So the first way I did this was to use a regression equation to develop this simplified hydrograph you see on the left. And the way it's entered in DST is just a couple parameters. You specify a peak flow, and then the time of the peak duration, TP, and the overall length of the hydrograph in this trapezoidal function. So the way I came up with that was using some of the information that was provided, namely the height of dam, and the volume of the water stored in, in the reservoir um, using a regression from uh, Dave Froelich's paper, you can determine a peak flow from a breach based on um, the type of failure mode and the, the height of water and the height of breach. So this is the equation I used to do the uh, breach peaks for the embankment. And then, to further define the hydrograph, we use the volume um, of the reservoir and adjusted the, the two time durations so that the volume underneath this curve is the uh, roughly the stored volume in the reservoir. So you're releasing the whole reservoir in the hydrograph, basically. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so the Froelich paper was developed for estimating breach outflows from earthen embankments. So it was good for most of the dams that we looked at. But one of the dams um, is uh, at Negreros is uh, roller compacted concrete. And so 
I used a, a different equation for that. The McDonald language monopolist paper, um, it was. It was tuned over a whole wide range of of things. So it's a really more broad equation and much simpler. But uh, it, it gave a little bit more realistic uh, outflow for that. And then this, um, so we talked briefly about this on our last call, but I wasn't sure how you had developed the hydrographs for your previous work that we were comparing against. And so I think that I heard it was Froelich method from his 1995 paper, but if someone could confirm that, that would be helpful. Or was it something completely different? So, um, actually, uh, what we used is a simplified model that was developed for us uh, by Linac in Portugal. And we don't we don't have a hydrograph. Actually, it's just a conversion. It, the the simplified model only used the reservoir storage and the dam height. And then based on some calculations, it produces a inundation map. So it's a very simplified one. Oh, okay. Okay. But the emergency action plans that the dam owners uh, elaborate, develop them, and they they use. Uh, similar models that you were presenting using the Proelic equation and maybe others joining with the Ross and uh, doing you do that that the kind of simulation. But we don't have that for those two specific dams. Our idea is just to, com to compare with the simplified model that we have uh, for classification for for a, a preliminary screening of the consequences of that dam. Okay. Failure, dam potential failure. Yeah. So I'm going to show a lot of comparisons of the floodplains and what I'll be comparing against is this, um, our method using the Froelich 2016 equation or McDonald language monopolis. And, um, and then against um, your simplified method that you're talking about. So, here um, on the left is the uh, what the hydrograph looks like and the peaks that I got for each of the different dams. So at Negreros, we looked at the embankment and the RCC dam, uh, both holding that reservoir back and got slightly different peaks. And uh, I estimated the height of the embankment just from the terrain data that was available. So that's a little bit different. But as you heard from Jason, we also have been working on this um, breach calculator method, which is also built into HECRAS. So I wanted to compare a little bit against that to see how it would work. And so that way we're actually modeling the breach outflow as, it, as the breach um, erodes and progresses over time. And so these two results, I was able to do that for Ipanema Dam and uh, I'm going to just call it Fatima instead of the whole name. Uh, but you can see that those peaks compared pretty well with the, the peak regression equation that we had. And then the volume under each of those curves is basically the same because they're releasing the, the full reservoir. So I um, can show you a couple of those uh, results to how it might look different when you have more accuracy in the, um, the breach outflow. So, as you'll notice, these are all pretty short hydrographs. Um, as short as in time, the longest being just five and a half hours. Um, but yeah, most of them are done in just a couple hours. Paul, just to clarify, after next week, the hydrograph on the right will be available through the dam screening tool. So, you won't have to input. The one on the left, like you did. Correct. Is that correct. You, okay. Yes. It, other information is required, but it's hopefully easier to come by information such as the height of the dam, the length of the dam, how much storage the reservoir holds, uh, things like that that um, are used for the regression for the parameters.
and it's a more realistic looking hydrograph then. Okay, so results for Ipanema. Um, I started with this one because it's kind of the least interesting and I can just show the general idea quickly. Um, so the big map you see on the right is the comparison between our best estimate of the floodplain in the green color and the uh, simplified model that uh, ANA provided in the orange outline. So you can see we're generally a, a smaller footprint almost everywhere. And, um, but, but very similar, I guess, um, because it's kind of just contained within a, a, a river valley and it's not spreading out very far into the floodplain. So, uh, but still, we were overestimating from what I see. Yes, we yeah, we are showing overestimate there. And this one was done with the, the high resolution terrain and the um, peak regression. What you also see on the far right is that this is just a small blow up of a much larger floodplain that we we looked at. We took this flood all the way down to. Uh, where it would fizzle out and basically be uh, be commensurate with the the normal flow in the river, um, so kind of took it to its logical end, and so we we're able to model a lot longer um, beyond this area and beyond the limits of the high resolution terrain. Also, um, here in the middle, you can see some differences between the high resolution terrain and the low resolution terrain. Um, so the low resolution actually is a smaller floodplain than a high resolution, and that's pretty consistent um, through all the dams we looked at. You can see in the results the difference between high and low resolution. The high resolution has a higher population at risk and more structures flooded. It's flooding a larger area, but the life loss is actually lower. And I, that, I think that's because it's getting um, more accurate information uh, as far as the actual depth and the resolution of the depth. So, um, where the structures are located geographically is typically a little bit higher ground than what you would find in a 30 meter grid around it. So I think we're showing lower depths near the structures and therefore lower life loss. And you'll see that's pretty consistent as well. Um, on the left, you see the difference between the uh, the re peak regression method and the modeled breach uh, hydrographs, and then the change in population at risk and and the number of structures flooded for those also. Um, so that is actually a smaller floodplain. Here's the results for Negreros, uh, a little bit more interesting. Much bigger dam, much bigger pool, much bigger population at risk. So on the right, you see the location of the high resolution train and low resolution train. And the results here for the difference between the, um, those two for a failure of the RCC dam, that's the larger of the dams there. A uh, pretty sizable population at risk and number of structures flooded in each case. And then um, a little bit higher life loss for the low resolution terrain. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting is uh, even though the with a high resolution train, we looked at the RCC dam failure and the embankment failure, and it flooded the exact same number of structures. And the floodplains are almost indistinguishable except right close to the where they fail. So once they get into the same channel, um, the results look almost identical all the way down um, to the bottom of the model. You can see there's only a very slight difference in the population at risk between those two failures. But a, a little bit more life loss for the embankment. And why was and that? And why is that? Yeah. yeah, same question. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure exactly. I think it, it's hitting. You have two dams. Two dams. 
a principal and an auxiliar. The, the main dam is of concrete and the auxiliar dam is embankment. Okay. So the indentation well, maps... very different from one to the other, although the other parameters are pretty much the same. So... Yeah. And the embankment actually has a lower outflow than the uh, concrete dam. Um, I think it's just getting to a very vulnerable population faster than the RCC dam. I, I'm not exactly sure. I didn't go into um, details trying to track that one down. But yeah, that was interesting. The inundations maps are different, right? Between the yes. two cases. Here's the, I, I colored them both in blue. Okay. You see oh. um, at the red, red dot here is the RCC dam. And um, on the right side of that is the embankment dam. Hopefully you can see my cursor. Yes, I can. Okay. So you can see there the, the, the two floodplains uh, overlaid on each other in blue. There's a little bit of difference here, uh, but then basically after the confluence, they're nearly identical. You can't really tell them apart. But there is a significant difference between that and the, um, the simplified method. The and orange is still ours, correct? Yes. Our estimation, okay. Yes. And so I was a little curious too why um, there's abrupt ends to the mapping that you did. Like here, um, it's just a straight line at mm -hmm. the bottom. Yeah, there is a, a criteria. It's an arbitrary criteria that we end the inundation map after 10 kilometers from the dam. Oh, okay. That's so yeah, we did. Jerry. It, you can see in the map on the left side where we're indicating potential for life loss, and the majority of the life loss is beyond that ten kilometers. Yeah. Uh, That's the thing that we should think about. Yeah. Well, in the in the in the screenshot on the left, what is that second? area of orange that you have this uh, further over here on the east side is actually the floodplain for terra nova dam so okay. the negreros dam comes into the terra nova watershed eventually and goes through the same area um yeah and that is I'll show some more on that later, but um, that's kind of a a point of interest, I guess, uh, how how that would be modeled and kind of some of the difficulties associated with that. But um, yeah, I guess all I want to show here is that yeah, there there is a significant amount of potential life loss beyond the limits of what has been mapped, even all the way down here. Possibly, our hydraulics are not as reliable this far away because we're using diffusion equation instead of a full momentum. But it, we're showing there is a possibility for life loss, even, you know, I didn't put a scale on here. Sorry. And that's bad map making, uh, but I think that's about 100 kilometers. So okay. Paul, for, for us, do we just model until you said until the Blood wave is dissipated. Is that the case? Basically, yeah. So here we ended this model because it enters a much larger river with a, a reservoir shortly downstream. So and be able to handle whatever is going on there. Yeah, we just we keep going until we expect the flood to be contained within channel or um, into another lake or water body, something like that. I think the oh. MMC defines it as point of no consequences you model to the point of no consequences so paul uh could you have an idea uh be based on the 30 meter dm how much volume volume was lost over the 100 year kilometers or something like that because of the depressions in the dm 
when you don't have like the channel? Uh, Garrett might be able to speak to that better than I could. Um, because you're model, you're modeling like a hydrograph. So, yeah, the difference between the, I, I believe the, the last Anna model was just to apply such an attenuation of the peak, and just get some samples of cross sections, and run like a one D model. And you like in a instead of flow, and you don't have like any kind of loss of the volume over the over the area. So it, it's it, it's good to see not 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 for now, but how, how much volume was like lost because of the 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 lack of precision of the DM. It would be good because yeah, sometimes, definitely yeah. you could see, when you animate the results. You can see that there's water stranded in some of those depressions in the terrain. It's like it's held back even as the flood moves downstream. So you're losing that volume um, in, in some places. Are those but dams yeah. like big dams? Is okay. It'll be controlled by the the flood extent. Will be controlled by the the topographic, the mountains, uh, the floodplains, the outside the area. But I'm. I'm just concerning here that using like a, as we have here in Brazil an available DM 30 meter resolution using for like medium to small dams and the model just lost all the volume in the first kilometer or something like that. I'm just thinking here because of the conservation of the volume and, mm -hmm. and we don't have how to keep the peak or have such an attenuation of the peak yeah based on the on the channel and the okay yeah it um in a couple of slides we're gonna we're gonna talk about that in a little more, more right detail. okay 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 thanks we'll come back to that any other questions on this one i'll look at uh one more result yes uh, oh i have a question mm -hmm. uh, uh... You you said that uh, DST use uh, uh, what kind of model? I think that you said that it's a diffusive model to to simulate the flood plane. I would like to ask if uh, it is possible to use full momentum equations in DST. Yes, the, the that option is there. Um, it's just you know slower run times. When you okay. use full momentum, so we we're just going for the quick answer. And it's it's possible to adjust the time discretization or special discretization and and something like that on this model. Yeah, you have some control in the DST over the mesh sizing and the time steps. We're using ah, okay. if you're familiar with HECRAS, we're using a current controlled time step yes. slicing. Yeah. So um, that is available as well. Um, okay. we, we basically wanted to run it in the kind of the most simplified approach where you would be doing it on a, on a large scale across the country. But there, there are a lot of options for somebody who knows what they're doing with the model to improve it. And you can even download the model, um, adjust it in HECRAS on your desktop and, and re-upload it back to the DST to run LifeSim or, or whatever. Okay, so DST, it's uh, it's we can consider DST like a part of HECRAS. Use uh, because we we, we can we can uh, do this kind of analysis on HECRAS, and uh, I think that DST it's a it's a specific part of HECRAS that are modeling the bridge and the failure. Am I right? Yes, it is. It is HECRAS, and um, it, Garrett has done all the programming for that, but it's um. It's basically just sending certain parameters to HECRAS and running HECRAS um, under ah, the hood. Okay. I understood now. Uh, okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think the, uh, probably the easier way to communicate that is it's just a web application that runs HEC RAS, and you don't have the full ability to control every parameter in RAS, but you have a lot of them, and it's, it's very specialized for dam break scenarios in this case. So. Cool. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Just. Okay, last one um, 
that I was able to do was uh, Fatima. And here's the, the result for that. Again, uh, the simplified ANA model in orange and our high resolution boundary in pink. Um, we have a smaller floodplain. Uh, not a whole lot of interest here. There's not wasn't many structures in the area. You can see a total of like 14 to 19 that were impacted. Population at risk from 20 to 28 and very small life loss. Um, this one was interesting, maybe for other reasons, though, because there are several. Uh, what I would call check dams, very small dams that cross the river. That are not really represented in the terrain. And so I guess you guys are going to have some discussion on that in a week or two, maybe I forget when that's scheduled for, but about sequential failures. Um, and that'll be something to consider with these, uh, these kind of systems. Yeah, we're actually, we have that scheduled for the beginning of February. Oh, okay. So a little, little ways out. Okay. So. Really, the biggest question is, how does the DST work with 30 meter terrain? Because that's what's mostly available um, for the whole country. Um, and it can be supplemented as you have better data available. But we want to make sure it works um, or that we understand how it works with the, the base level of terrain. So here's a, com a quick comparison of the results. For each of the three dams, uh, we ran at high res oh. and low res terrain. Yeah. Can I can I ask just a quick question? Uh, did you compare or try? Or could, could you calculate what would be the life loss with the inundation map that we provide you, or it was calculated only with uh, the ones developed by DSD? Yeah, unfortunately, only with the ones in DST because. Okay. We require dynamic hydraulic results that includes um, mm -hmm. depth and velocity and the arrival time of the flooding. Okay, nice. Thank you. So we could, with a uh, GIS overlay, estimate the population at risk and the number of structures flooded. Mm -hmm. uh, I did not do that, but we could. Um, right. But we're not going to be able to get to life loss. Right, because we we have that. Uh, in our estimates, because all of those two dams were classified by Anna uh, in terms of uh, the, the degree of consequences, and they, they have the estimate of life loss, but just based in this overlapping of the inundation map with the houses that you see on Google Earth. Uh, and so that's probably a nice comparison that you can do later. Mm -hmm. But thank you. Yeah, and we'll provide this presentation to you um, afterwards, and and uh, we can. So you'll have that for for quick comparisons. Okay. So, looking at all three of these dams, where we compared high resolution and low resolution terrain, um, some trends popped out, and they're a little bit counterintuitive. So, first of all, the higher resolution terrain in every case had more structures flooded and a higher population at risk. So, it's a bigger floodplain than the lower resolution terrain. Um, but also, in each case, it was actually lower life loss with the better terrain. And I pointed that out in the one case for Ipanema, but it was consistent through all three of the comparisons that we ran. So, you can see on the right. Some of that might be related to a more accurate definition of the fringe. So we're looking at blue is the high resolution, yellow is the low resolution. And so we're we're extending that floodplain out into the fringe and maybe capturing more people, but at lower depths and velocities. So kind of the you know, people who aren't at very high risk, but um, we're showing them as part of the population at risk. Um, you also see in general. Were you though, were you referring to Ipanema? This this picture here is Negreros on the right, but I'm referring to all of them. 
because yeah, it's really Panama, a consistent trend. Oh, it, yeah, it caught my attention that the population at risk is very, very similar. However, the life loss, is, there's a big difference here. So how, why is that? Yeah, I think in each case we're showing lower life loss with the better terrain. And I think that's because we're getting more accurate depths and velocities at the locations of the structures. That's my my guess anyway. It'd take a little bit more digging to know for sure, but um, because we're adding population that's on the fringe here, which is better defined, they're, they're people who are not really at high risk. And then where we have overlapping structures between both methods, we're getting better definition of those depths and velocities. And so they're probably lower on average because structures tend to be built on more elevated ground it, as compared to all of the, you know, a 30 meter grid square. Well, that's my hypothesis, but I don't have a great answer for that. From the, the standpoint, though, of a screening level approach and oh, getting an estimate of life loss, sorry? Can, can I give my opinion here? <laughs> so yeah. I, I believe that lo looking at the different DM, it seems that the primary uh, flow in the high resolution uh, is like more containing, more contained in the in the channel, right? So the velocities are more reported in the channel, mm -hmm. and the DM when you have like a coarser DM, it, it's like you're spreading all the velocity over the, the 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 entire cross section at the first time, right? So, and the volume will govern how be the uh, the flood extent, the flood extent will be very close because of the volume, right? Not, not, not because of the, the velocities or something like that. So that, that's my guess. Yeah, we're able to differentiate higher and lower momentum flows better on better resolution terrain. Yeah. That makes sense. Um. So I was going to say also, at, at the level of a risk screening and hazard identification, um, there's not a lot of difference in these results. I'm showing them down to you know tenths of a of a person average life loss in some cases, but big picture, the floodplains are very similar. Populations, the number of structures, and the life loss are all in the same order of magnitude for all of these cases. So I think that is a a, a point for you know verifying that the thirty meter terrain is working pretty good. So I wanted to point out a couple issues that we saw. Um, this on the left is the city of Terra Nova. Here's a, a dam um, that's very poorly represented in the terrain, in the 30 meter terrain, and the flow just kind of goes right through it. And so it inundates a lot of the city. And this is a, an area for Negreros dam failure that shows a lot of life loss um, because it's Im impacting a significant portion of the city. And so you'd have to consider, first of all, that you're representing that dam properly. Uh, and second of all, um, you may have to consider the sequential failure of, their, of that dam if it's overtopped. So releasing an even larger flood wave. So maybe this is underestimating, maybe it's overestimating, really hard to say at this point. The picture on the right um, is also interesting for different reasons. You've got the what I assume is a, a much newer uh, Terra Nova dam, part of a, an irrigation scheme of some kind. And it was not represented in the terrain at all, uh, just because of the age of the terrain, I'm guessing. And so the flood doesn't recognize it, it just goes right through it, uh, floods the area behind it. So that would be much different if it were in the terrain. Um, 
Jason mentioned one of the things that we're planning to do is to add terrain modifications. So you'd be able to put a line on top of that dam and raise the terrain to represent that embankment um, in the terrain within DST and, and improve it um, in, in the near future. Paul, uh, another question. Uh, can we use brick lines on DST? DST? Yes. Because maybe, okay, because maybe maybe this this could be a a reason from uh, for the the water goes uh, through the this this floodplain. Uh, if we don't use brick lines in this case, it could happen. I think. Yeah, that's true. Even uh, even if it was in the terrain. If this dam was yeah. in the terrain, it could still flow through there if it's not if there's no break line on top. Because, of, because of the cell cell yeah. can, can be can connect this the, the upstream and the exactly. Okay, thanks. The the break line feature is another thing that's going to be coming out in the version next week. Uh, cool. We've also got some other hydraulic modeling no nos, uh, like these isolated ponds here, which is a, a, a problem with the mesh and, um, you know, not using brake lines. Basically, we did a very quick model with no brake lines in it for everything. So, um, if you were, if you, there were structures that were located in these low spots, or we would try to remove those or, or isolate them with a brake line to get a better answer here it doesn't really matter because there's no structures there but that could be an issue in some places um, there's all kinds of other potential issues and and this is my pitch and soapbox for um, having somebody who's qualified to review a hydraulic model actually look at the results and say that makes sense or that doesn't make sense so you can have problems with Linear embankments, as we were showing, and and like uh, Arthur said, um, that could be resolved with brake lines, disconnected flood areas like this, inadequate terrain or bathymetry, as Garrett mentioned, you might not have good representation of the channel and lose capacity, um, or lakes as well if you've got um, you know intermittent lakes, sequential failures of dams and or levees. Um, making sure you have a realistic breach hydrograph. So the, the breach parameters is gonna be in the, the next version of the DST, but those are also based on regression equations. And sometimes they give ridiculous results or things that don't match with reality. And so you need to have a critical eye on those as well. And then you can all have all kinds of computational hydraulic issues that need to be resolved by adjusting the time step, choosing the, the proper um, equation set for the, the hydraulic solution, um, updating the roughness parameters, and just looking at the overall reasonableness of your depths and velocities, because those are used to estimate the life loss. So any of those could be you know, potential pitfalls that lead to bad results. And so good to have somebody who knows what they're doing, take a look at them. So the last question um, and kind of a jumping off point for. Can I, sorry? can I ask a quick question before you move on? So yeah. failure of dams in series is, is something that we've talked quite a bit about um, with this group, just because it's something that they've seen happen in Brazil. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing that, that next virtual workshop of how to model dam failures in series. Is the DST able to accommodate that or how would you accommodate evaluating failure of dams in series here? In its current version, it's not able to, but soon we intend to include that. Um, it's kind of our, it's not next week's version, but um, in the near future, we'll be able to do that. Jason, you want to chime in there? Yeah, the, the cascading dam failures gets complicated, um, but the the work that Garrett's done to build out the the RAS model behind the scenes is going to allow us to to do that through the dam screening tool. It's just not it's just 
going to kind of be an, an expert user approach. It's, it's going to have uh, a little more uh, complicated inputs to make it work right. Are you expecting that to be available with the next large portion of the update when you're when you're including performance and loading, or is there some uh, intermediate? Uh, yeah, that, that'll be within a couple months. All right, thank you. So the next question is kind of can ANA use the dam screening tool now and and in the future, and how would that look? So. Um, this is a lot of speculation on our part about, you know, your purposes and, and needs and um, really, I think, just a jumping off point for some broader discussion with the group. So we've assumed based on the conversations thus far that your primary purposes would be hazard classification and developing flood maps for emergency planning. And we think it's a good tool for those purposes. Um, there are some requirements uh, of the users to develop uh, data, and we can go into more of that information. We also, you know, might be able to give some advice on what kind of personnel or funding would be required to sustain your efforts with um, it, with data input and and development. Um, and then we just kind of. Looked at some of what we've done so far, our, our, our average screening time is a couple of hours to develop the, the model and get results. But that's assuming that you've got, you know, the terrain data in hand and it's not giving you huge problems. So, yeah, happy to open up discussion to, to everyone at this point and let me know if you want to look at anything else. Or if there's no discussion, really, I could go into uh, looking at the, the camera dam. So. Anybody have a. A Hank, so, a so, question. Uh, what do you mean by N NSI updates? That's our abbreviation for the national structure inventory. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, as Jordan mentioned, it was a somewhat simplified approach. And uh, Jordan, you want to jump in? What kind of updates and refinements would they would they need to work on? Yeah, sure. Um, so I actually have uh, an email pulled up now. It's with with the document, so I'm going to send that out. I mean, actually, I'll hit send right now. So it's heading your way. Um, Toward the end of that document, um, I go through quite a few data sets that are out there um, that I was unable to use. Um, and, you know, dealing with that much data, it just it takes a lot of time to refine some of that and quality check some of that info. So it'd be uh, kind of an iterative process, um, but like number of stories, uh, occupancy type, um, what the structure is actually made from. Um, those are just a few that that need to be improved because um, when you're when you're thinking of life loss, you're you're worried about stability of the structure. Um, so the current iteration just assumes a wooden structure, which is our least stable uh, um, assumption. Um, so if we were able to refine that, you would probably see life loss numbers go down in more urban areas. Um, and then I, I added something in the chat too that I wanted to make clear that mm -hmm. this this data set is like uh, definitely assumes some conservative values, but that's that's not to say that on a study by study basis you can't go in and refine those structures. Um, if you're looking at a a study area, uh, it'd be easy to to pinpoint a few uh, that have higher consequences and actually refine those structures using you know like Google Earth or. Uh, something that's another GIS software. Yeah, especially if we're looking at, you know, 20 structures that are impacted for some of these, you can 
grab more information. Was there another question? Yeah, I was just thinking that if we manage to um, get more data, this data that you did not find, and still using the 30 meter um, model, we could have a better refinement then. Because from what I'm seeing um, between the 30 meter one, the, the high resolution and the low resolution, they are both using very few data, just the data you could pull off. But if we can pull off more data and still use the um, low definition model, we can have better results. Am I right? I believe so, yes. Yeah, you, you'll have more defendable results. Um, and this is, a, this is a process we, we go through when we do any of our studies is we have our starting national structure inventory, um, but we don't just use that and, and stop. We, we ask somebody to, on the team to look at the inputs. Um, and as Jordan was saying, the results and, and focus in and say, do those make sense? So we do some Google Earth drive-bys and refine that. And <clears throat> so this is a good starting point. It can always get better. And I think there's some stuff that you could probably find and build into this pretty quickly to make it better. Um, but it's a continuous process and it's, it's never going to be perfect. So you always want to have some somebody doing the study with some eyes on it. Yeah, I was just wondering if the variables that you used are the most important ones and if the other variables that were not used would impact a lot the result. What I mean, yeah, it, is... really, it really depends on the, the, the study that you're looking at. So if you had something with, okay. I mean, population, obviously, it's, it doesn't matter how you're, what you're sampling, if the population numbers are wrong. Um, so that's definitely one you want to be as refined as possible. Um, Number of stories, um, if you have extreme depths, that, that could play a big role. If the structure doesn't collapse and people can evacuate upstairs, um, that's, that's an option in the methodology built into the DST. Um, so if you do have high depths, the number of stories could be a critical variable. Um, uh, construction type, so if you're looking at stability, if you have high depths and high velocities, um, if it's a, you know, it's, concrete structure, maybe it would withstand that and people could survive inside. If you assume it's a wooden structure and it collapses, then everybody inside samples from a high hazard fatality rate. Um, foundation height, if it's a difference, if, if it's a three foot raised foundation or, you know, uh, close to a meter, um, as opposed to, you know, 0.15 meters, maybe those people were not actually impacted um, or were not touched, uh, which would respect that would change your damage in your content estimates. So it really depends on the flood characteristics. Um, but again, none of that matters if your population <laughs> numbers are wrong. Um, so it, it kind of goes back and forth just depending on um, what exactly you're looking at. So long story short, yes, I think refining any of the variables would could impact your results. Yeah, sure. Uh, just to uh, double check if I understood correctly, uh, the, the red, the, part of this slide, uh, which is related to population. So uh, you got the, the population at the municipality level, but you need, you probably need the population uh, or the number of inhabitants in each uh, house, right? In each structure. Yes. So how, how, do you, how did you do that? You know, so Model. This so the first iteration is it's extremely simplified approach. It's just dividing those structures at the municipi municipality or di dividing the population estimate at the municipality level by the number of structures uh, okay. within that municipality. So it's it's a straight uh, it's just a, it's just spreading those out evenly across. Um, and in some cases that resulted in a decimal value. Um, and the way that was handled is it, it was randomly. Uh, rounded up or down. Um, so there's some variation, but it made sure the, the overall total stayed the same to those uh -huh. uh, estimates. So that's that's how we did it in our first iteration. Um, and then as the census was refined, we um, started to make assumptions. So that's that highlights the occupancy type. So um, 
what the structure is actually used for. Um, if that variable could be refined, then you could build a logic into putting more people in commercial structures during the day, um, moving those out of the industrial structures back into a residence at night. Um, you can start to build those assumptions in uh, to your population. Um, but I, I, I outlined some data in the document that I just sent that could help you do that, distinguish between industrial zones, commercial zones, and residential zones. Uh -huh. um, and, and maybe in the next iteration, it would be easier to, to make some of those assumptions, but uh, it's, it's an extremely large data set, so it would take some time to work that in. Okay. But then you, you just assume the hypothesis that's in the right, right? Uh, single family residential, single story wood. Yes. That's all your assumptions. Okay. Thanks. And within the DST, you can alter those fields. So if you zoom into a structure and that's not right, you can edit that in the DST. Right. And last questions about the Google's open buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking with um, Gabriella yesterday. And you mentioned that uh, you, you guys have already downloaded the data or put it in a data set for the entire Brazilian territory. Yeah. Is, that, is that right? Do, do, you, do you already have that? Yes, yes, it's downloaded. Um, I'm not sure how we'll be able to hand that over to you guys, but that's something I would yeah. pass it's, over. It's, <laughs> it's a very large big... data set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Nice. Thank you very much for all, all of that effort. Thank you so much. I think one of the things that we wanted, the reason why we wanted to mention this is because just using the DST will create some maintenance type of work internal to ANA, to the agency. So um, I wanted you guys to just be aware of that. That um, that there would have to be, for for example, like the core, like Jason just said, um, we have to also maintain the structure inventory, and we have a certain uh -huh. amount of funding that that and that happens on a yearly basis. Is that right, Jason? Yeah, right. We we update it annually within for ours, right? Because better data comes available that we can build into it, but also because of population shifts and new development and all that, we try to keep track of. So, yeah, it, it takes effort to keep this up to date. All right. Uh, um, I'm going to jump in here real fast uh, because we're trying to set up the work plan for next year. And I think this is a this is an amazing presentation, guys. Great work. Uh, I think you really showed the value of it and, and did an excellent job. Going point by point and, and really, really presenting your data. Good, great job. Um, Alan and Tuana and the ANA team, um, I see this as, as part of the plan moving forward. So could you maybe speak real quickly to, to the areas that, that you like, that you might want to incorporate in your program? And, and then while they're doing that, um, the core team, can you kind of start thinking about if you were to continue to move forward with Anna and doing this type of work, um, you know what what would the progression look like over two to three years um, at a depending on what Alan says really, but at a you know maybe a, a two hundred fifty thousand dollar a year to five hundred thousand dollars a year. So Alan, could you kind of kick us off on on your thoughts of how if and how you might want to proceed with the dam screening tool? Yeah, that that is something that we still need to discuss a little bit more internally, right? uh, especially with Rogério and, and Josemar and Elton. Uh, and they're in the meeting, maybe they can say something about it. But I, I can see that they want to improve their uh, simplified method that they use for them um, uh, risk classification, then hazard classification. And using the DST is is a very nice path in my view, um, but that will require lots of efforts in terms of you know organize all of the database that we still don't have it. But I, I see that uh, uh, with the this this Google inventory of buildings, uh, that's 
that's a big advance. I mean, compared with the data we we have, it make things a lot easier. And one concern that I have, and and everybody has, is actually the our uh, uh, the the D DEM, right? The the digital terrain model. Uh, we're still using the uh, SRTM. Uh, we are now uh, shifting to a new DEM uh, that's called ANA DEM. It, it was just released uh, a few weeks ago, and it's much better. Uh, it's based on Copernicus, but it, it has lots of, uh, you know, improvements on that. But it's still, it's a 30 meter resolution uh, DEM. So the, the errors in the hydraulic calculations, I think will continue. So that's a concern that I have. But I, I don't know, Rogério, if you want to jump uh, in. Uh, a lot of information, I'm still <laughs> Simulate, but uh, it's very interesting uh, DST because of the two-dimensional uh, uh, information or modeling. Because we uh, we have a problem that, uh, as you see, the population at risk, we we can't evaluate the danger the the danger to to people. I think you use some. Uh, uh, levels of velocity versus uh, uh, height of the, the flow to, to consider if the people is at risk or not, yes? So you exclude the, the, that one, that's why PAR is so higher than the, the life loss, yes? And it's very interesting because our simplified method, we we are on dimensional. We have uh, perhaps next the the data from the EBGE, EBGE that you was thought we have data of a new census, and uh, they have the data in the the houses with uh, the coordinate the number of people in each 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 house but we don't have access to this information because they they treat this as a um, strategic and uh, uh, protection data but we can improve this but my concern is more about the time to 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 model each of them Yes, we have a lot of dams and and uh, it's interesting because it's an improvement, a very good improvement about this uh, velocity and, and the height of the flow, more accurate. And Alan has uh, told about the new new DAM that we has developed by based in Copernicus, but they they have some improvements in the. I think in the, the resolution and the hydraulic uh, of the, the the rivers, and uh, but the problem is is still I think I understand you have two or three hours of this uh, 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 personnel, this uh, specialist for each them to to evaluate the the hazard classification. Or I understand, or, or I, 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 it's not this, I understand. Because for Anna, the mo most important is the hazard classification. Emergency action plans, too, but for us, the hazard classification is, is, uh, is our big problem now. Because we have perhaps a million dams to estimate this hazard classification. So we need to, to, to have something more, more uh, simplified and more best. 
I, I know that the error is very is great but but uh, we need to have a um, in advance some some idea of if you have uh, that them is is a problem or not not only in uh, to all of Brazil yes okay we we struggle with some of those same issues right and the level of effort versus the decisions we're trying to make um, and hazard classification in the US uh, can be a big deal right if it's high hazard the requirements on that dam are significant and can lead to a lot of extra investment on that dam on the order of millions of dollars right so putting in the necessary effort, whether it's a couple hours to a day, um, makes a lot of sense when you're dealing with the potential and decisions and investments based on that decision. So <clears throat> when you're you're when you're mentioning obviously a, a lot of dams, do you think a, a couple, two or three hours on average is is more than is available for you to to work through those given the importance of the decision well from my perspective um thinking Are about how we meeting? can advance can you hear me yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so thinking about ways to advance from this point on, I think um, this was a great presentation. I think we could have a very good idea of what the DST is able and how it can help us. It is definitely an advancement from the Simplify model that we have today at ANA. And um, I think that now we have to get together with our team and see um if we are to change the way we, we have been doing things if we are to uh, use the dst from now on and if yes how we can implement that with the uses um it is obvious from my point of view that the model is very good and it would help anna tremendously but i think we need to go internally and see how this can be used if we have enough data to use it and um, how much would it cost to be frank as well and we have to see how much we still have in this contract and if what we have left would be enough for us to advance and well i don't know alan do you want to compliment yeah, Dor, I agree. Um, I think we need really to to have this internal discussion and digest a little bit more all the results. But um, it's clear that we have clear, uh, you know, great advances compared to the methodologies we are using right now. Alan, do but, you want uh, us to uh, prepare? A proposal for January 11th, or how would you? Um, I don't know. I, I have to ask to Rogério. <laughs> Rogério is really the guy. Okay, okay. Because uh, we're we're coming over Christmas right now, and um, but they, I don't know they how you guys are, but we are, we're user loose. So to get these guys to uh, available to, even though it is a month, it's really only like a week or two. So it would be sure. difficult to get too much, but we could. We could do a rough order of a magnitude type thing and a couple of bullets and a, a couple of line items uh, if you want, but just let us know because uh, uh, we want to get you what you need for January 11th, but at the same time, we don't want to burden people with extra work over their holiday season. Sure, but they, they have other uh, more slides to present, right? Because I'm not sure if we interrupt his presentation. <laughs> we, There's another. No, <laughs> The only thing left was that optional um, kind of the validation study he did with the Camara Dam. Is that right, Paul? Yeah, Camara Dam. Yeah. Yeah. 
So he, I'm, I'm sure he'd be happy to share that if you if you want to take the time now, or he can send you the slides or whatever you guys want. Well, if you if you can show us, uh, if you have the time, it'd be nice to see it. It's a kind of yeah. iconic dam failure in Brazil. Yeah, take it away, Paul. Okay, so. I don't know how much time we have. I think we're scheduled to be done quickly. So I'll I'll kind of rush through the the beginning stuff and apologize for sharing my screen earlier, but it just it just struck me that I was talking to Rogerio online through LinkedIn about 200,000 dams in Brazil and put it together that we were on the same call. <laughs> so <laughs> sorry about that. Um Anyway, so this is Camara Dam. I guess it, most everybody is pretty familiar with this one. Famous because it was one of the only reinforced concrete dam failures in the world. Uh, failed on first filling in 2004 through a, a slide in the left abutment. Here's what the dam looked like just after its completion. Now, let me go ahead and put this in presenter mode. Um, I'm going to skip over a bunch of slides, but I'll send you what I have here. Um, you can look in a little bit more detail about how the model was put together and and that stuff. But um, here's a cross section. So the dam is about 50 meters high with a central spillway over the middle of it. And I'm using uh, a set of most of my sources here on the sides as well. So you can see there it's coming out of this paper from uh, Professor Barbosa and others. Um, the volume at the breach was not full. Uh, the reservoir capacity is 26.5 million cubic meters, but it was only filled to a little over 17 million. Um, and so we, I used the reduced pool at the time of breach. Here's what the, the failure looked like, taking this chunk out of the left of abutment. It just kind of popped out right. Um, you can see it's kind of hard to see, but basically it started at the gallery entrance um, on the downstream side, uh, which is this little hole right here. And um, that was like the starting point for the failure uh, within the dam. The, the foundation is another story. Um, the breach 